All right, folks, it's time. It's time for our favorite podcast, Cut to the Chase. And it is my distinct honor and pleasure of bringing on Michael Haggard onto my show. How are you doing today, Michael? I'm good. How are you, Greg? I'm excellent. Excellent. Thank you for asking. So, you know, I have been practicing law for, I don't know, almost 30 years. And over the time that I've been practicing law, trying to keep up to date with what's going on, and verdicts are a key thing, seeing how cases are unfolding, what you can get if you actually go to trial and try your case and put on a good case. And year after year, I would see one big verdict after another, one seven-figure, eight-figure verdict. Who's trying to get Michael Haggard? I'm like, who's this guy, Michael Haggard? I mean, after years and years, I premises liability, accident cases, I said to myself, you know what? I got to meet this guy. I'm tired of seeing all these great results and not actually knowing who he was. So I got on the phone, called him up. He answers. We set up. a. We went old school. We went and had lunch together. And I think, Michael, you paid for it, right? I might have. I got to check my receipt now. Yeah, you know, you might be paying for more than one way, more <laughs> than just one way. But there were two things from that lunch that really struck out. Uh, on my end, one of which was Michael's passion to actually try cases. When we left the, the restaurant, we were talking about calendar call and everybody's trying to get out of trial and all that. And he's like, I don't understand this at all. I'll try my cases on a holiday, on a weekend. I want to try my cases. That's number one. And I have to ask you, a lot of people that are listening that have lawyers, have you asked your lawyer, have they tried a case in the last year, the last two years? How many cases have you tried? Because if your lawyer is not trying cases and getting results, you're probably not going to get fair and full compensation. And that's what you want. So you need to make sure that you're going to a lawyer that's trying their cases. Now, the big news, I know this is cut to the chase. I'm supposed to be cutting to the chase. The big news in Florida this year was we had tort reform. All these different torts, personal injury kind of cases and laws are changed and not necessarily for the better of the consumer. So Michael is gonna come on today and discuss it. Now, the second thing that happened at our luncheon that was very, very impressive was that Michael isn't just the kind of guy who's gonna try his case, get a big victory, pay his client, get himself paid, end the story. If there's a problem that he sees in these cases that can be corrected, he's actually going out and doing it. He's talking to legislatures and all that. And I don't know of any other lawyer. I mean, once the lawyer, most, Lawyers that I know, they get their money. That's the end of the story. Maybe they'll try to market it. But this man here actually, as a public servant, tries to correct the problem so these things don't happen again. And he doesn't have to get hired again and bang out a big victory. So anyway, this is Michael Haggard here. And we're going to talk tort reform. Are you ready to go, Michael? I'm ready. I'm fortunate on that topic. Uh, it's not my favorite, but we got to deal with it. We got to deal with it. So it's been a number of months already. Let's go through, give us the basics. What got, what laws got changed? How did they get changed? And then we can go on to what's, how it's playing out and how you think it's going to play out. Yeah, well, it's kind of all related to what you talked about. I mean, one of the reasons I love trying cases so much is that a jury gets to decide. I mean, sometimes we forget you sit here in the United States and, you know, we talk about a lot of amendments a lot. Like, you know, criminal, we talk about the fifth, we talk about the sixth, the fourth. Talk about the Second Amendment. We have this debate all the time. Well, the Seventh Amendment really is what sets us apart. It's the right to trial by jury. And uh, we're one of only three countries in the world that allow civil disputes to be um, handled and tried before a jury of our peers. And there's one group that doesn't like it, and that's corporate America and its insurance companies, because they want decisions to be made coldly in a boardroom uh, where you know claims managers, corporate representatives, make decisions. They don't like individuals, peers, and the greatest system to resolve disputes ever on this earth. They don't like it at all. And so what they do is they try to go change it. And the way they try to go change is they give absolutely huge contributions to legislators, to governors, to uh, different politicians, so that they can somehow, even though they're wrong on the issues, pass what we call tort reform. Uh, in reality, it's tort deform. Um, and what they did this year was really about as about as strong uh, and unjust that's ever happened in the state of Florida. And it covers a number of different areas. It covers such things as your property insurance. 
Uh, for anybody out there right now that are getting their property insurance renewals, just understand if you're going to get property insurance and you're going to get windstorm insurance and you think you have a policy of up to a million dollars or something that will cover you 100 percent, you no longer do because you are not able to have your attorney be paid by the insurance company any longer in the state of Florida. You are going to have to pay your lawyer. So what does that mean in what we call first party insurance? What it means is if you have a storm come through, and my Lord, if you're in South Florida right now, we have storms every afternoon, um, and you have a big uh, hurricane come through and it, it causes $150,000 in damage to your house, it, you know, any contractor you bring out, somebody comes and assess it, your roof is gone, you know, all these different things have happened. Um, you are going to have to pay an attorney one third of whatever your recovery is to get anything. That used to not be the case because it makes no sense. If you have coverage, the insurance company should pay it. And if they want to dispute it, that's fine. But then your attorney who you have to hire to get what you were already owed by contract, they were paid by the insurance company because that's right. They were disputing your claim. That's no longer the case. So every policy you buy, Life insurance, if they challenge your life insurance and you had a million dollars of life insurance and they say, well, you know, I don't know, Mike was involved in the one car accident. Maybe he killed himself. Maybe our suicide exclusion applies. Well, then you've got to hire the widow has to go hire her own lawyer and pay them a third of that million dollar policy, even though you've been paying premiums on a million dollar policy for 20 years. So the insurance company got a windfall through uh, the insurance uh, actions in the bill. And that's one aspect, Greg, I don't know if you want to cover that anymore. Or you want me to go on to the next because there's several aspects to the bill. Yeah, no, no, let's, so I just, you know, to me, what I see is a recipe for denials, insurance companies denying, delaying the whole nine yards. So, you know, you could talk about a $150,000 claim, uh, you know, you hire an attorney, they have you sign a, a third, it might be even 40%, the attorney, you know, has the incentive, even if they have to fight for a couple of years, they can see that maybe they're going to make forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. But let's just say that it's a smaller claim. It's a $5,000 claim. But to you, that's not a small claim. You're the homeowner and you're like, wow, that, I mean, $5,000 is a lot of money. You start knocking on the door and, and no lawyer will even return your phone call. So you are SOL. So, okay, when you talk about going to the boardrooms and corporate center and insurance claim adjusters or whatever, they are, believe me, I know that they are saying to themselves, we're going to deny this because we know we can get away with it. They're not going to hire an attorney. They can't hire an attorney. No attorney will take it. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it goes for every aspect of what we call first party insurance. And that, so for instance, your health insurance. You know, there is no, you just made a great, great example. You go, you go, your doctor wants you to get an MRI. You have some symptoms. It's not approved. You're not going to find a lawyer to sue the insurance company that you pay premiums for, for an MRI, which might cost $2,000, $1,500. But if you don't have $1,500 and you're covered by this health insurance, your employer pays, or you took that job with the government because you have great health insurance. Now it has been reduced. And let me tell you, they promise reduce premiums. I, I would bet everything I have that insurance rates are never, ever, ever going to go down. And this is just a windfall that they have paid these politicians year after year to get this. And they had the trifecta this year with the governor, the Speaker of the House, and the President of the Senate, who gave them everything they wanted. And you're right. It, it, really, it really impacts everyone. But the most who's always impacted um, are the folks, the working folks who can't afford and live paycheck to paycheck. And now there are great benefits in their job when somebody says, you know what, I know I could maybe do something else, but I want you know, my love is being a police officer, being a firefighter, being a, a teacher, being a any you can name any government job. One of the greatest benefits is your pension and your health insurance. And they just took apart the health insurance benefit for our frontline workers in the state of Florida. And it's a disgrace. 
And when you talk about the, you know, their whole argument is, oh, the insurance premiums are going to go down. They're not you, the consumer. You don't realize they're not telling you these these lawyers are not telling you that you're going to end up paying less for your insurance premium. My years ago, they did medical malpractice reform. What translation caps? You can only get a certain amount of money, you know, too bad. Right. And that was supposed to reduce the medical insurance premiums for the doctors. And they did studies after that. No reduction, none at all. So, I mean, I just we're going to we're saying it now. We're going to we're going to put we're going to play this tape back five years from now. We're going to see. Yeah, maybe they'll give you a little reduction this year just so that they can pat themselves on the back and tell the governor, you see, we gave all these reductions or whatever. But it, believe me, it's going to go right back up, I think. All, all right, right, let's move on to let's move on to the next the next genre. Yeah, and so th there's a lot of genres, unfortunately. You know, two things that they did this year is you know, usually in Florida to file a claim, uh, you had four years if it was an injury. So, you know, you, you could have a really bad uh, back injury. You could have a back injury that's gotten worse over time. You had four years to file your case. If, if God forbid, it was a wrongful death case, someone died, you would have two years. Out of the blue this year, the Florida legislature came in, backed by the Chamber of Commerce, by associate industries, by all the big business groups, and they lowered the statute of limitations from four years to two years, which is a really big deal. And two things are going to happen from that. Most importantly, uh, people are going to miss the deadline and not be able to get justice. Uh, I, I'll give you examples. Minors who are sexually assaulted uh, and, and, and things like that. People who don't want to talk to a lawyer right away. They want to see how they do. They want to see if they can resolve the case themselves. They want to see, wow, you know, how injured am I going to be? I think I can recover. But then later on, they don't. They've shortened that for two years. And the other thing that it's going to do is it's going to increase litigation. You know, Greg, if you and I had a case and we're coming up on the two-year statute of limitations and our client's like, you know, I just don't know what I want to do. Well, here's what you got to do. You got to file suit. Back in the old days, you could wait a little bit and decide. You could try to settle your case out of court. Now everything's got to go to court in two years. It makes no sense. There was no compelling reason to do it. No evidence, no testimonies put forward, uh, but they passed it like that. Now, the other thing that they did is normally Florida was what we call an accountability state. Defendants would pay their fair share and plaintiffs uh, would get what they were entitled to. So, if you had a case where, let's say, a woman slipped and fell uh, on water that was left in a grocery uh, grocery store's aisle for some time, they were clearly negligent, uh, they violated all their procedures. If, if the jury found that, well, I think the supermarket was certainly liable and negligent, but, you know, Mrs. Jones should have seen that. Mrs. Jones is 50% at fault. So she's at fault, they're at fault, split it down the middle, everybody pays their fair share. What would happen there if the result was a $100,000 verdict, then Mrs. Jones would get $50,000. Her award would be justly reduced by her percentage of negligence. Now, the Florida legislature, again, out of nowhere, has said, if you are 51% at fault, you do not recover. So if Miss Jones is found 51% fault, let's say a juror has said, out of morality, I just have to say Miss Jones is 51%. So she would get 49,000, not 50. Not in Florida anymore. She is out. She is absolutely out, cannot recover anything. But the flip side isn't true. Let's say the defendant was 75% at fault. Shouldn't they now pay 100% of the damages? No. So it's a one sided um, advantage for the defense, for corporate America for insurance companies. And those are just two other items that they added into this omnibus bill. All right. So the first, the first segment of this with the insurance, I, I can understand, I can, you know, I don't really understand, but I can kind of see where they're going in and they're saying, Hey, you know, all these hurricanes are coming. All these insurance carriers are leaving. The premiums are going up. Nobody can afford it. We got to do something. Oh, let's go after the lawyers. Okay. I got it. Right. But these two things, shortening the time frame to file a lawsuit and this 50 percent barrier, what how did they they had to have said come up with some explanation to justify these changes? What what was it? 
You know, on the statute of limitations, I can tell you, I was there. This was a blitzkrieg, by the way. This this bill, the most significant curtailing of citizens' rights in the history of the state of Florida, was done in three weeks of an eight-week legislative session. It was all done so that Governor DeSantis, when he came in on Fridays from running for president, would come in and sign a bill. He wanted this bill by Friday, March 24th. And that and the legislature is working towards that deadline, not listening to testimony, not listening to victims. So on the statute of limitations, they simply said, well, a lot of other states have it, so we should have it. What they would do, what they would try to do on the comparative negligence would say, you know, well, there's been cases where a trucker rear-ended somebody uh, or, or was rear-ended and then, and then, you know, was found to be so much percentage of fault and somebody wasn't. All these crazy examples. And what happened in Tallahassee was a bunch of bikers, motorcycle riders came to Tallahassee on their own to say, wait a minute, you know, in bicycle and motorcycle accidents, there's a lot of comparative negligence involved, as in every automobile accident. Somebody yeah. somebody turns left in front of somebody else. Who's at fault? You know, it, it's, it's a battle of the evidence and the jury. So my, motorcycle cases have that a lot. And the motorcyclists back in the day when they wanted a bill that said they had the right to not wear a helmet, the counter argument was, well, you can be comparatively negligent for not wearing a helmet. They said, fine, we will agree to that but not to 51% were out. And they changed the game on all these motorcycle riders who, by the way, those aren't liberal Democrats. Uh, these folks were from rural areas, red areas, Republican areas. And they told that Republican legislature that they will not vote that way anymore. And the legislature didn't listen. And, uh, you know, when you've got the kind of money um, that industry has, the insurance industry in corporate America, you can influence, unfortunately, a lot of uh, a lot of the members of the Florida legislature. And that's what happened. All right. So let, let's let's you know, I can understand like in practicality, I, obviously, I can understand the two year issue. Right. And uh, somebody comes into your office they're they've like you said, they yeah, they thought, well, it was a little accident. I don't want to deal. I don't want to go to court or whatever. And then it's like a year and a half later. And you're like, wow, I you know, I've lost two months of work. I can't you know, lift my, my grandkid, whatever, you know, and you're starting to come to, to grips with the fact that you are entitled to compensation. All right. So now you're like, I'm like trying to find an attorney. You can't find an attorney. You're running up to the two year. I can see how that plays out. You know, somebody comes into your office, you know, a one, one year, 11 months and three weeks after the accident. And you're like, well, I'm not sure whether you're 50% fall 2%, but you know what? I'm the last person that you're going to be able to talk to. And I feel bad for you. So I guess I got to take the case and file. I could see that playing out. And a lot of lawyers are probably going to make mistakes, maybe get into litigation. They shouldn't just because of that scenario. But the walk us through, somebody comes into your office, a motorcycle accident, big damages, and you can see that they did some stuff at, at you know wrong. And you can see the other driver or the truck did some stuff wrong. How do you know whether they're 50 percent, 25 percent? I mean, how does an attorney, how do you make that assessment? Yeah, you don't. The only people that make that assessment ultimately is going to be a jury. And uh, and so it's something that, you know, I think a lot of people's cases are going to be turned down. That shouldn't be on both avenues on, on the statute of limitations. You know, statute of limitations gets close to the end lawyers have to sit there and say, look, if I make a mistake, if I name the wrong entity, if I don't know about something, I'm going to be legally i'm going to commit legal malpractice so that's another aspect that happens but no we we've you know we've had cases where we know it's going to be a battle of comparative negligence and i've tried those cases and you know you you have arguments to a jury and and, and you feel very confident about them the problem is people are going to turn down cases being being maybe scared of that uh defense now because it will could result in an absolute zero and not go in front of a jury and so that's that's very problematic. It's tough to assess uh, and everything along those lines. And I think what's going to happen is people with, you know, serious injuries, but not catastrophic injuries are going to be left behind because lawyers can't take the chance on those cases if there's a significant element of comparative negligence now versus later on. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure that the, you know, the audience fully grasps how unnerving as an attorney it can be to be presented with a case 
and say to yourself, well, I got to cover every, I don't know, every part of the corporate structure and everybody that was involved. Maybe it was there was an accident, but you didn't realize there was some construction going on and all that. So it it becomes a scenario where by default, a lot of lawyers are just going to say, I'm turning it down so that I don't have to worry that I messed up. Yeah, absolutely. And that's going to happen. And and, uh, and it's terrible because you're talking to clients who say, I know, I know that I might have made a bit of a mistake, uh, but the defendant certainly did as well. And, and, you know, I could name a million cases that I've handled. I mean, I handle a lot of child drowning cases, terribly sad, awful child drowning cases where a kid gets away from their parent, gets to a broken pool gate, possibly at an apartment complex and drowns or nearly drowns have a catastrophic injury. Yeah. Well, jury's debate. Okay, the apartment's at fault. They have a code violation in their apartment complex. But what about the parent? The parent wasn't watching them. They got away. Well, is that who's got more than 50% in that case? You know, we have successfully argued and never had a problem with that. You know, but I've handled those cases for 20 years. I, I know, so, you know, a lot of lawyers might be scared of that case, say mom or dad wasn't watching them. They'll get 70%. I'm not taking the case. What if that? client doesn't call me we'll call someone who's proficient in child drowning cases they never ever are going to recover something when they should yeah terrible all right so any more changes oh yeah we're only halfway through all um, right let's go yeah let me let me talk a little bit about um something near and dear to my heart i represent a uh, majority of crime victims and and in cases where um crime victims are either robbed you know, unfortunately shot and killed in an apartment complex, in a mall, at a gas station, any commercial premises you can think of, or sexual assault cases in the same place. And unfortunately, in the state of Florida, we have had a run of slumlords, terrible property owners. And I think most of the audience will understand. They see people buy an apartment complex, do no improvements to it. And then you'll see, wow, that, that piece of property sold for $50 million? Are you kidding me? Because we're a flip it state. That's what we are. You know, we have more REITs, re, uh, real estate investment trusts in the state of Florida, anywhere in the country except for California. Okay. Um, and that's what we become. And these developers and these insurance companies who insure them have become extremely greedy and don't like to be sued when they don't have proper security. So they don't like these negligent security cases where you do have a young boy killed an apartment complex that's had 10 prior shootings because they didn't have security. And the reason why is businesses don't want to pay for security because security doesn't get you money on the backside. Uh, the reality is it does because it keeps your premises safe and, and you don't have problems. So what the Florida legislature did with absolutely no research, um, they didn't talk to security experts. They did two things. They said, well, even if you're negligent, Okay, even if you've done everything wrong, you didn't have lights, you didn't have security guards, you had a broken gate, you had five murders beforehand, and a jury finds you negligent in a court case, in a trial, you can then turn around and blame the person who pulled the trigger. And you can reduce your culpability, your 100% at fault. The jury thinks, well, but this bad guy shot him. So I'll put 75% of the fault on the bad guy. And now that victim's award of let's say a million dollars is reduced by 90%. And I use the example of Tallahassee when I was there those three weeks, we, we flew up 25 different crime victims. And a bunch of them were Parkland parents. And the Parkland parents sat there in front of this legislative committee and said, 100% of the criminal guilt goes on Nicholas Cruz. Nicholas Cruz is an animal. He killed 17 people that terrible day in Parkland, Florida. He is not civilly responsible. The school board and the school and that police officer allowed a known entity. They knew they kicked him out of school. They knew he was a ticking time bomb. They let him in. They're civilly responsible. That's why we have two different courthouses. But the Florida legislature listening to such entities um, as Publix, as Walmart, all these developers um, were able to get this passed after it went down 18 years ago. 
with the for, with the Republican legislature with Governor Jeb Bush, they lost that in the Florida Senate because it makes no sense to blame the criminal who are, is the person you're supposed to protect against, anyways. And that's one of the elements where they hurt crime victims. The others is at the same time that they're trying to do this tort reform, the Florida legislature was giving a billion dollar giveaway to developers. And they were giving a billion dollars to what we call an affordable housing project where a million apartments are going to be built in the state of Florida over the next five years. They're giving a billion dollars of our money, taxpayer money, to all these private developers uh, to build new apartments. And with that, what they want is a presumption, a legal presumption that they are not negligent if they have the following incredible security devices, a light, a deadbolt on your door, a camera, not a working camera, just a camera at the front, and that somebody comes through and makes sure that they have proper hedges and sight lines that, that really isn't a security assessment. If they do those ridiculous security things that no security expert in the country would say is real security, they get a presumption, even if someone is killed in their apartment complex where they'd had 10, 15 prior murders, they get a presumption in front of a jury that they are non-negligent. And that's two of the giveaways that commercial properties got in this legislative session. Yeah, that's just, uh, it's it's crazy. So negligent security, inadequate security, premises liability, some of the audience might, I mean, this is what we're all talking about. Security, you know, you're going to a 7-Eleven at midnight, you're driving and, you know, not the greatest neighborhood. You got to fill up for gas or you got to get some water. You know, you know, you know that it's dangerous. Nobody needs to tell you that it's there, but you got to do it. You're running out of gas. You got no choice. This place, that premises has actually put itself right there for, to capture that kind of crowd, to capture that money. And they know themselves that it's dangerous. The owners are not, they're not going to be seen anywhere near that property because they know themselves that's the most dangerous operation you could possibly have. Or yeah, maybe not th that mo the most dangerous, but they're now basically able to point the blame on the person that they were trying to secure the property from. Is that basically this this is the scenario now? Absolutely, and and it makes no sense. There's no difference for say someone's never caught, so the victim is not only victimized during the crime, they're victimized because there's never a criminal uh, trial, there's never an arrest. Then in a civil case, they get to be victimized again by a totally negligent 7-Eleven, like you said, who just says, we didn't do it. This un unidentified person pulled the trigger. Blame them. It makes absolutely no sense. Uh, there's going to be such inconsistent verdicts where the more notorious criminal may get a higher percentage, may not. You know, And so they did it for one reason, and that is everyone knows that if I can blame the criminal, why am I going to pay for 24-hour security? Why, why, why are we going to do that? We know we can blame the criminal if we ever get sued. And then on the flip side, with the apartment complexes, they now get a double whammy. They get a presumption of non-negligence that they do a couple things that make no difference, and then they get to blame the, the bad guy. Yeah. So if you live in an apartment complex or you have relatives who do, understand they have just become 100% more dangerous. And that's a terrible thing for me to say, but it is the truth. And all criminologists have looked at this. We brought in several experts to testify because the Florida legislature didn't talk to anybody. They didn't even talk to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement about this. They didn't do a study, didn't do anything. We brought forth FBI agents, people who really studied criminology, saying you are giving less deterrence if, if these apartments don't think that they will be sued, they will provide no security. They will provide none. And, and that's what they testified, and, and the legislature could care less. Because the Affordable Housing Coalition, which was billion-dollar corporations from outside the state of Florida who wanted that money, and they want immunity. They got a double whammy at the behest of taxpayers and citizens. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy because— you consistently hear, I mean, you know, since I've been born or whatever, crime is a big problem. There's a lot of crime. And, you know, I would say in the last five years, there seems to be some consensus that there's even more crime now. So is the solution uh, to make it so that 
people that are victimized can't get compensated by the companies that are not providing security? Or is the solution for these companies that know that they have issues with security to provide adequate security? I mean, we're not even talking about, I mean, their duty, the legal duty is adequate security. It's not good security. I mean, I, it should be like, you know, the best practices or something like that. No. I don't even know how we got dummy down to just adequate security, but you know, it's just aggravating me beyond, beyond belief. Yeah. And is, and is there more change? There is, there is, there's two more areas to cover. And, okay. and uh, one, one is the, the, um, the insurance companies um, have, have tried to, for the last several years, tried to do what they call the fair medical damages act. So for instance, you know, you're hurting a car accident, you're, you're hurting some type of accident, then you have the right to get medical care, take care of yourself through your health insurance, through Medicaid, through Medicare, whatever you might have. Or if you don't have insurance, sometimes you go to doctors that might get paid at the end of the case. And 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 the same thing for your future damages. And what, what the legislature tried to do, this is a legislature, mind you, that doesn't fund Medicaid, doesn't want to fund Medicare, doesn't take when the federal government gives different types of benefits to fund Medicaid, Medicare, they won't do it. They don't want that. And then in, in this bill, they, they tried to put in that the only damages anyone could ever get is tied to Medicaid rates, which is unbelievable because we all know that a lot of doctors won't take Medicaid rates. They won't take uh, Medicare rates because those are the lower rates. Those are rates we've all paid into. Uh, they're government rates on both ends, obviously Medicaid and, and Medicare. And so we were able to, to somehow lighten this a little bit for the citizens of Florida, where now the defense will come into every trial trying to argue that just give somebody Medicaid rates, just give them Medicare rates. So this is going to be a sub trial of a trial. It's what's going to happen. So, you know, a, a, somebody who comes in has been treated by a doctor because they didn't have insurance. The defendants, the insurance company is going to argue, well, that should be lowered to Medicaid rates. And into the future, they're going to do the same thing. And what really is, is crazy about this is we all know there's no guarantee of Medicaid being around in 20 years. I mean, every six months we talk about defunding our government. You know, there's no guarantee Social Security is going to be around. No guarantee that that uh, Medicare is going to be around. There's no guarantee that even if you have Blue Cross Blue Shield at the time of trial, you're going to have it in 10 years or what insurance you're going to have. And, and what the standard in the state of Florida always has been is very simple. You're entitled to reasonable medical care at a reasonable medical care cost. And that's very simple. A doctor comes in, testifies, you know what? Greg needs a fusion surgery. It costs $60,000. They can hire an expert to come in and say, no, it actually costs 50. But you never got into a battle of what insurance rates are and Medicare rates and Medicaid rates. So now this is going to be an absolute mess when you try these cases of all these experts. It's going to make litigation more expensive. And it's it's really just a shame that the big insurance carriers wanted because they want to intimidate people from bringing cases and intimidate lawyers and make cases more costly so lawyers don't want to go all the way to trial. So I know there are people that just hate the litigation. Oh, they hate litigation, the courts, the trial lawyers or whatever. But people don't understand. A lot of these people that get injured need medical care in the future. They might have already gotten medical care as well, but they might need it for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And so, you know, you want compensation. In other words, the what you can project they're going to have to spend because somebody rear-ended them or somebody attacked them or whatever it was. And now it sounds like that's not even going to be available. Or only, you can only argue to the jury that, you know, a certain amount whatever the Medicare rate is going to be, even though Medicare not, might not even be around 10 years from now. So I'll fun goo, buddy, you know, go, you know, cross your fingers and hope to die or something like that. I don't even know how to handle this, but I mean, it's just there. And so again, I ask you, what was the reasoning behind that? What did they say? What was their argument? Did they even have one? No, you know what though they try to say is they try to come in. They'll use a they'll use an example of where someone didn't have insurance, and they got what we call a letter of protection. So that they went to a doctor to get care, 
and the doctor gets paid at the end of the case. So the doctor's rate is going to be higher than Medicare. So they're claiming fraud. They're claiming all these different things. And what's always amazing is, you know, State Farm makes billions and billions of dollars, as does Progressive, as does Geico, as does every insurance company. You know, and the only insurance companies that ever go out of business are the ones that just do property. And one argument we've always made in Tallahassee is, you know, make State Farm right property. Make, make Allstate, make USA, make Geico, make all these giant carriers spread the burden, and you'll have no insurance companies ever go out of business. No auto carriers go out of business. You know, they make billions and billions. And what they try to do is come in and say that these, these claims have been, you know, absolutely amplified and ramped up and everything along those lines. When in reality, it's, it's you know, you usually have a situation where the surgery is recommended because the client can't afford it and they can't find a doctor. That doctors testified against this bill. Um, not only doctors, hospitals came out. Because hospitals are sitting there saying, we can't take everybody at a Medicaid rate. Are you kidding me? We can't. No, we can We can take Medicaid patients. But if Greg or Mike have, you know, Blue Cross or United or Cigna or whoever, then that's the rates. We're, we're not taking these rates. This is a, it was an absolute phantom project. Uh, but you don't have to have much evidence when you go with the Florida legislature because they already know their decision before they uh, hear any testimony at yeah. Wow. All right. So give me the sixth one. I mean, you really are depressing me. I'm but... sorry about that. It's yeah. Right. So the last, the last one's a little nuanced, but, but nonetheless, probably one of the biggest frauds that, that was committed. And that is the you know, state of Florida has always been one of the leaders to our court uh, cases over the years in what we call a bad bait. And, and what that means is, you know, if anybody on your podcast right now is driving their car and they're driving their car and they've got, $100,000 of liability insurance with State Farm. And God forbid they drop their phone. They spill a drink on themselves and they look down and a kid is crossing a crosswalk and they hit and they paralyze a young child. I mean, everybody's worst nightmare on both ends. Somebody just made a mistake, you know, and now somebody's life is virtually ruined. Well, the person who made the mistake knows, thank God I have State Farm. You know, I have a $100,000 policy. So State Farm, under our law for hundreds of years, would have to investigate that case and in a good faith uh, effort would have to settle that case immediately for their insured, for the person driving the car. And I'd ask everybody in your podcast, put yourself in that position. You're the person driving. Somebody's catastrophic injured. You want them paid immediately. You want, that's why you paid for insurance all these years. Well, now, the Florida legislature at the behest of only the insurance industry has said, you know what? You don't have to investigate that quick. You can take your time, take three months, even if it's clear liability, catastrophic damage, take as long as you want. We're going to put the onus on the victim to put forward all their evidence. And if they do that, you can have a 90 day grace period and figure it out. Well, here's the problem. This isn't about the victim necessarily being re-victimized. It's about the insured who paid those premiums because if they don't resolve the case and the victim wants to sue me now personally above my insurance limits, they can. Whereas before I would have rights against my own insurance company to say, no, 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 no. You should have resolved that. Why did you delay so long? Now you've exposed me to a $10 million judgment and not only individual policyholders, drivers, but every business, if you open, if, if you own a small bait shack, you know, in, in, somewhere on, on a beautiful beach town in Florida, and one of your drivers, who all they're doing is taking, you know, they're taking, I don't know, some fish or something like that somewhere, and they cause that same accident, you could lose your whole business because the state of Florida decided this session that the insurance companies are more important than small, small businesses and consumers in the state of Florida. And they passed comprehensive bad faith reform that protects the insurance companies and gives them a get out of jail free card uh, in these type cases. Boy, I got to tell you, after hearing all this and ending on bad faith, the only bad faith, I mean, I'm not going to say the only bad faith, but the only bad faith that I see is not, you know, is the Florida legislators. And I have a feeling that other states similar to Florida 
are just going to plug and play the same thing. And it's going to take time. And there are going to be a lot of people, a lot of victims, a lot of people that are injured that are going to get shortchanged, no representation. And it's just going to be one sad story after another. And people have got to realize that if you want change, you're going to, you know, it's almost a political, it's become a political issue now. And you're going to have to vote in people that are going to actually listen to what you want. And you want protection. You want security. You want, when you pay an insurance premium, you want the benefit of those the, of that policy. Michael, I thank you for coming on to the show today. Uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way? I am going to drop. Go ahead. Yeah, my email is mah at haggard, H-A-G-G-A-R-D, lawfirm.com. And my cell phone, call me anytime, is 786-506-9946. All right, Mike, thanks for coming on to the show today. I know you're a busy guy, so I'm, I tried to get this out and done as quickly as possible, but we covered a lot of information. And I thank you again. Uh, that'll do it for this episode of Cut to the Chase. I am going to drop in my show notes Michael's information in case you want to reach him or someone at his law firm and to see all the great work they're doing. They are doing amazing work. Special man over here. I'm proud that you came on my show. Honored to have you uh, talk to me and my audience. Thank so you so much. I really enjoyed it. All right. That'll do it for this episode of Cut to the Chase. Subscribe, rate, review. Let me know if you have any questions. Maybe you have questions of Mike. I can maybe drag him back. You know, six months from now, we can see how this, all this all tort reform is really going, all right?